Good morning, everybody, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are viewing from today. So I'm going to talk to you about my PhD thesis entitled Understanding and Incorporating Aphid Parasitoids Within IPM Strategies in Australian Grain Crops. Within Australia, agriculture as we know it began in 1788 with the arrival of the first European settlers. Only around 6% of the land is suitable for growing crops and pastures, and around a third is not suitable for any form of agriculture. However, I'm particularly interested in grain crops, and there are six major grain crops that I've listed here within this country, with wheat being one of Australia's major exports. Grains are grown along this darker green region that you can see here at the bottom of the country and also a couple of areas within Tasmania. They're grown as drying crops with a very set amount of rainfall and in a cooler climate than that you see at the, the north of the country. And I've put a quote here by Bill and Melinda Gates. Almost no country has achieved a rapid ascent from hunger and poverty without raising agricultural productivity. The global population is growing exponentially and we face a real issue feeding this growing population. Now, one of the issues we face are crop pests. And the pest I'm particularly interested in is the aphid. Around 100 species of aphid are of economic significance as crop pests. They're particularly devastating in that they attack at every growth stage, causing the most damage early on during the seedling stage. For the past century, we've relied upon host plant resistance and chemical treatments to control these pests. However, target organisms have become resistant to these chemicals and non-target organisms have had negative effects such as high mortality due to the use of these chemicals. And so we've moved on to the use of integrated pest management. Now this involves the use of biological controls or cultural controls and then uses chemical control only as a backup. I'm really interested in the biological controls. And in terms of aphids, pathogens can be used to control them and also predators. And I've got some photographs up here of different predators. You have generalist predators such as the predatory beetles, such as the ladybirds, spiders, but also specialists such as predatory bugs, lacewings, and surfeits, which are predatory flies. But the use of these organisms is not new. In 1800, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, suggested that aphids within hothouses may be controlled by the artificial use of the surfeit fly larvae. But the beneficial group I'm really interested in are the parasitoids. Now, parasitoids differ from parasites in that they kill their host during their development. Parasitoids can be found in the Diptera group, for example, but the parasitoids I'm really interested in are the wasps. And in terms of aphids, you have your aphid host. You then have the primary parasitoids, and these include the, group, the subfamily Aphidini and the family Aphelinidae. They use a modified sting called an ovipositor to probe the aphid host and lay their eggs within, within the body. And rather like Ridley Scott's alien, the larvae feed on the inside of the aphid and then burst out after they develop. But just to confuse matters, not only do you have your primary parasitoids, but you also have your secondary parasitoids. And these require the development of the primary parasitoids for themselves to develop. And they can be split into two different groups, the hyperparasitoids and the mummy parasitoids. Now this inset picture in the top right that you can see is actually an aphid. Unlike the little green aphids that you usually see, this is golden and engorged, and this is because it's become mummified. So we call this type of aphid a mummy, and that's when a wasp has already started to develop within it. And it, the body becomes hardened, rather like a shell, and it pro provides protection for the uh, developing wasp. 
Now the hyperparasitoids attack the aphid before it becomes mummified. They lay their eggs within the developing primary larvae and then they wait until the mummification process happens and they themselves develop. However, mummy parasitoids attack an already formed mummy, paralyzing whatever wasp may be inside it. And again, just to confuse matters further, not only do they par paralyze primary parasitoids, but they can also do so with other secondary parasitoids. And then the larvae develop instantaneously. So that's a little bit of a background there, but I'm gonna move on now to my thesis. And I'm gonna discuss with you just very briefly, each of my research chapters. So I monitored aphid pests and their associated natural enemies within southeastern Australian grain production landscapes. I'm only really going to talk about the parasitoid wasps uh, today. I'm also going to discuss the rates of green peach aphid parasitism in canola crops across Australia, the taxonomy, distribution mapping and host relationships of aphidine wasps, and finally, I'll move on to the effects of insecticide seed treatments on green peach aphid parasitism by a parasitoid and predation by the green lacewing. But I'd just like to mention a couple of the appendices here. One is of the biology, ecology and management of the Russian wheat aphid within an Australian context. Now this aphid species arrived, so we think, uh, in 2016. It was certainly first detected then. And this was published in Austral Entomology earlier this year. So if you have time, it would be wonderful if you could have a look at that. But also another paper that we have ready for submission is, uh, was, was led by Madeline Barton and models uh, a particular aphid pest and its associated parasitoid wasp under climate change effects. So beginning with my first research chapter, the monitoring of aphid pests and their parasitoids. And we asked the questions, what are the temporal patterns in the grain aphid community across the season? What are the temporal patterns in the parasitoid and hyperparasitoid community across the season? And what are the fine scale spatial patterns in aphid parasitoid interactions across the paddock boundary edge? So what did I do? Well, this work was undertaken over two years, in 2017 and 2018. And in the first year, I went out every six to 12 weeks. I undertook direct search, and this is by hand. So picking up any aphids, any mummies that I could find. I also reared out any wasps from mummies that we found. So I took them back to the lab and reared them out there. And also yellow pan trapping. And you'll see this inset picture in the bottom left. Nothing fancy, I actually used a plastic yellow camping plate and it attracted, due to the colour, it attracted different invertebrates towards it. And so everything that was caught there was sorted through. Unfortunately, however, we had a few issues with the yellow pan trapping. We had evaporation occur. We also had freezing occur. But also on occasion we had sheep drinking from our plates. And so we changed things up a little bit in the following year, in 2018. We continued directly searching and also rearing of the parasitoids. But just to get the finer scale temporal patterns, we went out more often this time, every three to six weeks. And in place of the yellow pan trapping, we undertook vacuum sampling. And this is rather like a modified hoover that sucks up anything that you find. Something we kept the same across both years, you'll see this diagram in the bottom there, is we sampled at the edge of each paddock, around 10 metres in and around 30 metres in. However, due to the slightly sporadic nature of the 2017 collections, we only used this year for, for comparison for 2018. That's because we were a lot stricter in 2018. We tried to use minimal sprays on the crops. We used only seed treated crops. And we made sure each was neighboured by a shelter belt of old gum trees and also an edge of grass or a grassy refuge of some sort. So everything was taken back to the lab. We then identified the different groups, looking at aphids, 
pulling apart the alates, which are the winged aphids, the atri, which were the unwinged aphids, but also looking at different predator groups and taking the parasitoids to species level. But I just want to draw to your attention here that the keys I used to identify these parasitoids were both by Rakshani, and one was from Iran and the other was from Malta. So I'm just going to briefly cover some of the results here. These graphs show the aphids directly sampled in 2017, and these are the top two graphs that you can see here. So on the left hand side I have canola, and on the right hand side I have wheat. For those of you who might not be aware of what canola is, this is, this is the same as rapeseed. The following year in 2018, we've also split the crops. So we've got canola in 2018 and wheat in 2018. And these graphs at the bottom here show not just the direct searching, but also the vacuum sampling. And each of the different bars there are different, sorry, each of the different colors there are the different paddocks that I sampled. Now, one major difference between the two years is the identification of these, uh, of these aphids within the group. So we didn't find the aphids in 2018 until around September, October time in large enough numbers. However, in 2017, we were finding them as early as June. However, one similarity across both years was that the aphid population increased as the time or the plant growth stage increased or progressed. We're moving on to the mummies now. Now again, the top graph here shows 2017 and the bottom graph shows 2018. And these graphs show the number of mummies that we collected and the relative frequency at which the primary parasitoids, hyperparasitoids and mummy parasitoids were reared. Now, automatically you can see a big difference between the two different years. 2018 is a textbook example of what you'd expect to find. So you have your uraphids increasing in numbers earlier on, and then afterwards you have a slight lag and you have your primary parasitoids, which is this blue color that you can see here, increasing. And subsequently you have your hyperparasitoids and very small numbers, but still there, of mummy parasitoids coming in. Unusually, however, this was not the case in 2017. So you could see in May, as early as May, the presence of both primary and secondary parasitoids. But even more interesting is the higher proportion of secondary parasitoids, the orange that you can see there, which are the hyperparasitoids, early on in June. Now this is likely due to the presence of green bridges that maintain populations of both primary and secondary parasitoids outside of the growing season. Now, each of the parasitoids that we reared were identified to species level. We did this with the reared parasitoids, but we also did this with those directly sampled and also vacuumed. And again, I've split this by crop. The lower picture is canola, the higher picture is wheat there. So I've split these. You can see canola in the top three pie charts, and again in the next two, and then wheat are the bottom four pie charts you can see there. Now I mentioned previously that we sampled at zero meters, 10 meters, and 30 meters into the paddock. However, just for the purposes of this analysis, I've lumped the 10 and 30 meters into paddock, which is the, the top row there and the third row down. And then the zero meters is the edge. And the reason for splitting these two groups is because we know what the host plant is within the paddock. It's either canola or wheat respectively. But at the edge, we could have a, a whole range of different host plants. And so the main thing really to take from, from these charts is canola within the paddock. So knowing that we've got canola as the host plant, you'll see this high proportion of dark blue. And that is Diretella rapi. Now this is a wasp species that really predominates in brassica crops. Canola is a type of brassica. And you can see 
but this wasp constitutes almost 90% in certain cases. However, this is not the case at the edge of the paddocks where mummy parasitoids and a different aphidine species called Aphidius matriciae, they dominated. Aphidius matriciae and mummy parasitoids also dominated within wheat, both in the paddock and at the edge. So due to this high proportion of Diretella rapi that we were rearing, just from the rearing alone, I decided to split them and look at the Diretella rapi wasp compared to all other wasps. And I looked at how, how the composition changed over time, both within canola, which is the top graph that you can see here, and wheat, the bottom graph. Again, Diretella rapi is the blue color, and you'll see it really predominates in canola, really peaking in, in early November. But in wheat, this is not the case at all. It is still found in wheat, but other species predominate and actually move in at a higher, higher numbers at slightly earlier on. And just a quick picture here of myself, you'll see how much equipment I had to take out with me each time I went. Rather a lot of hard work. So just a quick overview here of this chapter. Going back to those original questions, what are the temporal patterns in aphid community across the season? Well, Mises persicae, which is the green peach aphid, was the most abundantly collected aphid species. That said, Ropalocyphon paddy, which is an oat aphid, peaked first both within the wheat crop and also at the edges of both crops. Now this has been found in other studies such as in Germany, and this is because of the, the high dispersal rate of this particular aphid. It most likely moves into new areas earlier and establishes faster than other species. Vacuum sampling was also found to, to find these aphids earlier than direct searching. And this is probably due to the less targeted nature of this, of this sampling method. Aphids were found really from flowering stage onwards, peaking during the canola podding stage and the wheat heading stage. Now, this relates really to the premise of using these yellow pan traps that you can see in the picture here. The yellow color attracts the invertebrates such as the aphids towards it. This is because they look like flowers. It looks like a form of, of nectar, of, of feeding that these, these invertebrates do. And so you'd expect the aphids to increase in numbers during the flowering stage because they'd be able to feed on the plant more. Now, moving on to the other question, what are the temporal patterns in parasitoid and hyperparasitoid community? And also what are the fine scale spatial patterns in aphid parasitoid interactions across the paddock boundary edge? Now the aphidine parasitoid wasp species, Diretella rapi, was the most abundantly found parasitoid. However, this was not the case at the edge, where mummy parasitism and another wasp species predominated. This is likely due to the fact that Diretella rapi is particularly sensitive to brassica volatiles, and so would be more likely to be found in crops such as canola. Secondary parasitism was low throughout the season, especially for those reared. And this suggests that primary parasitoids are more successful at parasitism than secondary parasitism. Now, this would be expected because, as I mentioned previously, secondary parasitoids rely upon those primary parasitoids to develop. And so you'd expect less success due to the fact that there's another trophic level involved. That said, secondary parasit parasitism was higher at the edge than within the paddocks. This could be due to the different plant hosts available. Finally, primary parasitoid sex ratio was proportional to the aphid density. Now moving on to the next chapter. We then decided, due to the, the high number of green peach aphids that we found in the previous chapter, to look at different rates of green peach aphid parasitism within canola. And we wanted to understand when monitoring canola paddocks, how the observed parasitism rate of green peach aphid might relate to the actual parasitism rate. And we defined observed by the number of mummies we found within the paddock. And we defined actual as 
the number of wasps we read, read within the lab. Now, I would like to note here, we are fully aware that the number of wasps reared within the lab wouldn't necessarily correlate with the number of wasps reared within the paddock. And that's because within the lab, we maintained a particular temperature, humidity. And so if you had a cold spell, for example, in a paddock, you may have lost certain wasps from being reared. But that's how we define those two. And we also want to look at whether they varied with plant growth stage, spatially in a paddock, including from the distance from the edge, regionally, and with aphids parasitoid species composition. And so this was a big project uh, undertaken by several people in four different states. So you can see here we have New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and WA. And I'm afraid those, those maps are a little bit uh, small, but you'll see the different uh, paddocks that we sampled. We began with 10 paddocks. And then when we found green peach aphid to be present, we then whittled those paddocks down to five. A fee field mobile application was created for the sole purpose of this experiment. And it prompted the collector to look at the plant condition, the presence of beneficials, and the location of the aphids on the plants, for example, but also a number of other things. And it gave drop down menus uh, of different selections. So we sampled for aphids and mummies directly for either a minute or until 50 were counted. We sampled a maximum of 24 points where green peach aphid were not found or until we had eight positive sites. So whichever came first. And each of those sampling points were located over 30 meters from one another. We began at the crop edge and moved into the paddock. Not perpendicular to the paddock edge, but in a zigzag formation. All aphids and mummies were taken back to the laboratory and wasps were reared from each of these before being identified to species level. Now this, this is where it slightly differs. So mummies, I explained to you before, are, when, uh, are formed when a wasp parasitizes the aphid. And so we were expecting to rear wasps from those. That said, aphids do not become visible mummies until a few days after the wasp has developed. And so there is a chance that those aphids we've collected in the paddock can subsequently become mummies because they may have been parasitized only very recently. And so any wasps that were reared from seemingly unparasitized aphids, we called those wasps reared from lab-produced mummies as opposed to field-produced mummies. And so this was a very busy year. We collected over 11,000 green peach aphids. And you'll see in the top graph up here, I've separated out each of the different states and you'll see fewer were collected in Victoria. We also collected very few prior to the flowering stage. This was also the case in my previous chapter. And so I've only plotted the graph from flowering stage onwards. There was no difference in aphid population numbers as plant growth stage progressed. And this is likely due to the fact that, yes, in WA, we're seeing a progression. However, in New South Wales, it's the opposite. We're finding a decline in numbers. And so it's probably due to the variability across the states here. Most of the aphids we collected were found on the lower leaves of the canola plants. This is normal. This is what we usually find. And this is likely due to the fact that green peach aphid are found on the lower leaves of the canola plants, whereas cabbage aphids and turnip aphids are usually found on the racemes or the higher parts of the plants. So they're found in tandem. But interestingly, these aphids moved up the plant as the growth stage progressed. So I'm gonna draw your attention to this bottom graph here. The blue is the lower leaves where we found the aphids and the orange is when we found them elsewhere on the plant, such as the middle leaves and the upper leaves, the racemes, the pods, for example. And so you can see here during the flowering stage, 
pretty much all of the aphids we found were on the lower leaves. However, as the plant growth stage progressed, more and more were found higher up on the plant. We also found more green peach aphid on stressed plants than unstressed plants. However, when we separate, separated out these different stresses, we didn't find any difference. But moving on to the mummies now, we collected around 500 mummies. This equated to about 4% of the total number of aphids that we collected. We only found them from the flowering stage, similarly to the, the aphids themselves. And you'll see this top graph here. Again, I've plotted only from the flowering stage onwards and separated them out per state. But unlike the aphids, they increased as plant growth stage increased. This was also the same with the parasitoids. Now, when we found parasitoids in the paddock, we only noted their presence, we didn't count them. And I haven't included WA here because this was not undertaken in that state. But you'll see here, as plant growth stage progressed, parasitoid presence also increased. You'd expect mummies and parasitoids to increase in tandem because obviously the mummies are only formed by those parasitoids. But interestingly, the abundance of green peach aphid correlated more closely with the actual parasitism rates, so the number of wasps we reared within the lab, than mummy abundance, so the observed parasitism rate. So usually growers would go out and look at the number of mummies that we see that are within the paddock to gain an, an understanding of how much parasitism is occurring. However, potentially, it's, it's more accurate to do that with the number of green peach aphids present. And so from those 515 mummies that we collected, we reared 1,221 parasitoids. Now you only get one parasitoid per mummy, and that's because, as I mentioned previously, we also took in seemingly unparasitized aphids. And so the majority of these wasps were reared from aphids, seemingly unparasitized aphids in the field than mummies. And so in crude terms, that gives us uh, an actual parasitism rate of 237% as that observed. And that's across Australia as a whole. Now splitting it up per state, you'll see New South Wales, Victoria and WA don't vary too much, all between 160 to 180% actual parasitism rate when compared to the observed parasitism rate. However, we have a massive outlier and that's South Australia, which had four times as much actual parasitism as it did observed. Why this is the case? Short answer, we just, we, we really don't know. The long answer is likely due to the the lower number of stress crops in this state, the lower number of beneficials. It could be for any number of different reasons, the higher plant growth stage found here. Individually, we've looked at each of these different variables and, and nothing seems to, to affect the, the difference between actual and observed rates, but potentially it could be all of these different variables combined. But then taking it down to a paddock level, Around 57% of those paddocks that we, we sampled in had an observed parasitism rate that equated to the actual parasitism rate. And so you could argue that on a paddock level, observed rates give you a generally quite a good overview of actual parasitism rates. That said, around 10% of the paddocks had a greater observed parasitism rate than actual, and around a third had a, a lower observed parasitism rate than an actual parasitism rate. But again, when we reared the wasps from the, paras uh, from the aphids hosts, I identified everything to species level. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the two pie charts here. Now the two together, together give you an overall view of the parasitoids we reared. However, it's a bit overwhelming I'll get you to focus your attention on the top because the bottom chart is just showing you that yellow section of other wasps broken down. 
But the really the main thing to take from this, these pie charts is that, again, the high proportion of blue that you're seeing in the top chart, and that's because Diretella rapi again predominated the parasitism, around 75%. Now, due to this predominant wasp being the case, we also analyzed it further. So I'll take you to this other graph that you can see down here. And we wanted to look at the proportion of these wasps reared from lab-produced mummies, so those seemingly unparasitized aphids that we collected and then subsequently formed into mummies in the lab, and how this proportion of wasp rearings changed as growth stage progressed. Now what you'll see here, and I've split them up per state, I've excluded New South Wales because this analysis wasn't undertaken in that state, but as you'll see, that the proportion of Diretella rapi reared from seemingly unparasitized aphids decreased as plant growth stage progressed. Now this is likely due to the fact that as plant growth stage progressed, the temperature was warmer. Diretella rapi is slightly more sensitive to, to higher temperatures than other aphidines. And so presumably, developed faster as the temperature warms and so you're far more likely at a warmer temperature during the podding and senescing stage to to see those mummies within the field rather than having to take them back to the lab for them to subsequently develop into mummies and so just a quick overview of this chapter the observed and the actual parasitism rates varied across the different regions but less so on a paddock level. Actual parasitism rates were usually higher than that observed. Primary parasitoids were more likely to be reared from field mummies than secondary parasitoids. This would be expected because secondary parasitoids, as I've mentioned previously, rely upon the primary parasitoids to develop before they themselves can, can develop. And so you're already a few days into the process then. And so, their development is more likely to occur within a mummy that we can already see. And finally, mummy counts alone do not provide a clear representation of actual parasitism rates. I'm going to move on to my next chapter, the taxonomy, distribution mapping and host relationships of aphidine wasps. And for this chapter, I wanted to classify aphidines reared from, green, uh, from grain aphids within Australia through a combination of morphological identification and also barcoding. I wanted to understand the geographic range of each of these species. And finally, I wanted to analyze tritrophic levels, so plant host to aphid host to aphidine, to ascertain the host range of each species within these grain production landscapes. And I'd just like to remind you that aphidines are, are one of the, the, the different types of primary parasitoids, parasitizing aphids. And so what did I do? Well, I pulled on those, the data from those previous chapters. I also undertook further sampling. I did a trip to Tasmania, just because there was a bit of a knowledge gap in that, uh, in that state. I also had volunteers around Australia, growers, agronomists, and people involved in the previous chapter who sampled for me. And then finally, I decided to take data that was already out there. I looked at citizen science, such as the Atlas of Living Australia. But I also looked at different insect depositories around Australia. And I've listed a few around here. And I'll just take this moment to thank all the people that were involved in helping with this section. So pulling all that data together, I had around five and a half thousand wasps to look at. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the larger of the two pie charts that you can see here. Again, the two pie charts together show the overall picture, but the bottom pie chart is just a breakdown of this light blue other group. And so again, if you just want to look at the top one, that's absolutely fine. And you'll see the darker blue here, again, is our favorite wasp, Diretella rapi. It predominates all of those wasps that are catalogued historically and at present within Australia, almost 75%. And we wondered, is this the case across each of the different states and territories? So for those states and territories that we had samples from, 
I'm going to take you over to the other side now. I've split them apart, so I've got Dirotella rapi in the blue and other wasps in the orange. And again, if you want to have a look at everything, I've split the other into the different wasp species here. But I'm just going to focus your attention on this orange and blue different pie charts here. And you'll see for each of the different states, Dirotella rapi was by far the most predominant wasp. That said, in Queensland, we had a lot, of, much fewer Dirotella rapi reared or catalogued, shall I say. This is likely due A to the much lower number of samples we got from Queensland. We only had 60 as opposed to, you know, in the thousands in other states. And mostly because Queensland, the, the wasps we reared or catalogued were from horticultural crops. Now, Dirotella rapi is still found within horticultural crops, such as broccoli and, and different brassicas. We had, I think, quite a few broccoli samples there. However, Aphidius matriciae dominated in these crops. Aphidines become acclimatized to the, the host plant that they're originally reared from. And, and this could just be the fact that Aphidius matriciae were, were found more often on these horticultural crops and therefore continue to predominate in this area. But we won't know until we get more samples from the state. And so I decided to map out the distribution of each of these different wasps. Now I put everything on one map and we've got five and a half thousand points here. So you'll see it's a little bit messy. But just to show you in the legend there, the different list of species that we had. So we did have quite, quite some diversity. But then just to make things a little bit clearer, I plotted out each of the different species. And I'm only going to talk about three here, and these are the main three that were catalogued. So Dirotella rapi that I mentioned a few times today, you'll see is found across this, this grain belt that we have going along here. It is also found in Tasmania. But I'd like to, to point out a few notes. So we've got Dirotella rapi found quite high up within the country. Now this is a greater northerly point than we're finding for any species. So this could suggest why it's so successful in that it's able to, to broaden its range more so than the other species. Furthermore, if you look down at South Australia here, you see it's found on the east of the Spencer Gulf, but also on the west. Now we often have a gap between WA and the Gulf, and that's just due to the isolation of this, of this area and the fact that most collections don't seem to really occur along here. However, it is interesting to note that the Dirotella rapi is found here, whereas other species are not. And moving on to the next most commonly catalogued wasp, that's Aphidius colmani. You'll see, I'll draw your attention again, it doesn't go as northerly as Dirotella rapi, and it's also not found on the western side of the Gulf. It is found in low numbers in, in Tasmania. However, if we move on to Aphidius ervi, which is the third most commonly catalogued species, there are far more points for Tasmania. However, we don't have any catalogues for Queensland, so it stops quite low down. And this could be due to the fact that it's not able to reproduce at such a, a great rate as the other species at warmer temperatures. Perhaps it's more used to the cooler temperatures of the south region here. I have plotted the other species, but just for the, because of time, I'm not going to mention them here. Now, I don't know if you'll remember, but at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that I was using keys uh, by Rakshani from Malta and other countries. However, there were no, there were no keys for Australia alone. And so I decided to create a key for aphidines within Australian grain production landscapes. And I based this on the current species that I sampled. This is because even though there was a greater range of species found historically, I can't prove that those species are still here today. Um, and so I base this on, on the species I collected. I've taken SEM photographs and I've tried to make it as easy as possible for everyone 
to, to follow. So I've looked at things like the number of labial palps, rather than the need to, to measure wing venation, for example. And I've just put a few screenshots here for you to see. And finally, I've put in a note on how to sex these aphidines. So you'll see on the left hand side here, the female and then the male clasp, as you can see here in the, at the end of the abdomen on the male. And then I want to look at the host parasitoid relationships. And on the right hand side here, you'll see the two different graphs. The top graph I plotted as raw numbers of parasitoids reared from each of the aphid species. And just because we had so many reared from Mises persci, which was the green peach aphid, because we focused on, on that particular aphid at times, it really dwarfed those other species and it was very hard to see those different uh, compositions. And so if you look at this bottom graph, you'll see I've split it as a percentage of the total wasps reared. And for those brassica aphids, or those found in canola, you've had the green peach aphid, the turnip aphid, and the cabbage aphid. For each of these three, you can see that Diretella rapi, which is the dark gray on the graph, predominates. However, this is not the case, for example, in the Ropala siphon genus, so the corn aphid and the oat aphid. We have other species such as Aphidius nutritiae and Lesophlebus testosipes predominating. And Russian wheat aphid, which I mentioned in uh, our earlier paper, uh, newly arrived, we have Lesophlebus testosipes dominating. However, I'm going to draw your attention across to the table here at the bottom. And very interestingly, we found that these aphidine species had a greater host plant range than they did aphid host range. Aphidius ervi, which was the third most commonly catalogued species, was found attacking 10 different host plants. Diretella rapi was quite close behind with nine. Yet when you look at the host aphids attacked, Diretella rapi and Aphidius matricii were found on six different species. And then the next was five. Now the combination of these two is most likely why Diretella rapi is doing so well. Not only can it be found over a greater geographic range, it's also found attacking the most host aphids and almost the most host plants. But comparing this to international literature, it's found usually abroad that aphidines are found attacking only really one to two different host species. Now, this might be due to the fact that the aphidine fauna is relatively small within Australia. I only found 11 species during my study. And so there may not be, within Australia, be much of a need to specialise in different aphid species because there's less competition. And just finally, I decided to put this into a quantitative food web, and I've done this with the aphids and the host plants. We're just showing you here that most of the interactions occurred between Diretella rapi, that you can see at the top there, and Mises persicae, the green peach aphid. But we do have a lot of other interactions occurring around it. So I'm going to move on to my final research chapter, looking at the effects of insecticide seed treatments on the green peach aphid and the parasitism of this aphid by Phidias kalmani, which is our second most commonly catalogued parasitoid and predation by the green lacewing, Malada signatus. So what are seed treatments? Insecticides can be sprayed in a prophylactic manner across crops. However, these chemicals can leach into the soil and cause detrimental environmental issues. So as a more environmentally friendly way of doing it, seeds can also be wrapped within or coated, shall I say, in a, an insecticide, then planted, and the insecticide or chemical within it can move systemically through the plant and so is less likely to leach into the soil. But does this only affect the pests or can it have side effects on, on other organisms? And so we ask, does this have direct or indirect effects on Aphidius kalmani or Malada signatus, when they're exposed to green peach aphids that have fed on treated canola, 
And also, how do these different seed treatments compare? And so just a quick overview of this green peach aphid that I've mentioned so much today. It's highly polyphagous. It feeds on over 40 families of plants. This could explain why it's, it's so commonly found around this country. It causes damage through direct feeding, excretion of honeydew, where it can cause things like sooty molds. Most importantly, virus transmission. It can transmit over 100 different viruses. And just one of those viruses, the turnip yellows virus, can reduce canola yields by over a third. And so it's particularly devastating. And just to add to that, it's also become resistant to insecticides in over 74 different groups globally. And so it really is a, 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 pro, a huge problem and why we really should be focusing our attention on other methods of control. Now, little work has been undertaken on chemical seed treatments, more so with sprays on beneficials. And so this is why we've really focused on this area. Now, we treated the seeds. We grew them for two weeks. And as we were doing this, we also kept a colony of green peach aphid we selected a strain that was resistant to multiple chemical groups that we used within this experiment. The reason for this is if we use susceptible aphids, and we did try it with susceptible aphids, mortality was just too high. And so we fed these resistant green peach aphid on, originally on untreated canola to ensure that they were used to the host plant before moving them on to the final plants of the experiment. And so after those two weeks of those plants growing, we thin them out to eight plants per pot at the two leaf stage, added 100 green peach aphids to each of the pots for four days or 96 hours, and then did a zero day count. And the different seed treatments we used were gaucho, which is imidacloprid, a neonic, cruiser 350FS, which is another neonic, thymothoxin, and cruiser opti, which is thymothoxin, but also the pyrethroid lambda cyhalothrin. And just so I don't get too tongue twisted here, I'm gonna to refer to them as the treatment rather than the active ingredient. Cruiser itself, Cruiser 350 FS, is not currently registered in canola, but the reason we put it in this experiment is just because we wanted to understand if there were any effects for Cruiser Opti, which of the two active components were causing those effects. And so, this experiment, we had a parasitoid side and we had a predator side, and I'm gonna start with the parasitoids. So after those 96 hours of aphid addition, where we did the zero day count, we added six mated female Ophidius colmani to each pot, collected them 24 hours later, stored them separately within Petri dishes, and provided each with 50 untainted green peach aphid as hosts for them to oviposit within. And I'm saying untainted, that means we didn't feed these green peach aphid on seed treated plants, we only fed them on untreated canola. We then counted mummies that were formed both within the Petri dishes and on those original plants. Did this about 11 days or so afterwards to give them time to develop. And then we checked the wasps daily for mortality and the mummies daily for emergence. And we followed this through to the next generation as well. And I've got a little um, diagram here. You'll see the, the blue at the bottom, that's the seed. And just to show you how this chemical is taken up by the plant and how we'd expect it to be taken up through the different trophic levels, you'll see the active ingredients go into the plant. Aphid then feeds on the plant and then wasp then parasitizes the aphid. So you'd expect this different contact to cause the seed treatment to be taken up by each of the different trophic levels. And so I'm giving you a quick overview of the results here. We found no difference in parasitoid initial mortality, emergence rates, death rates, and survival rates on those original plants. However, we found fewer mummies were produced on the plants in the control treatment. So if you look at the top graph here, the B, then on the gaucho and the cruiser opti treatments, the A's, Additionally, on the bottom graph, you'll see more wasps, proportionally more wasps were reared from the Cruiser Opti treatment, the A, than the Control and the Cruiser 350 FS, so the different Bs there. 
However, when we looked at the petri dishes, which is where we put the, the wasps after we remove them from the plant, we found no difference between the treatments for the number of mummies formed, the next generation reared, the emergence death and survival rates for the parasitoids. But we thought, okay, it's all very well looking at each of these things individually, but overall, can we see which of these seed treatments is better? And so we calculated a total fitness, which was on cumulative wasp survival days. So we looked at the number of wasps emerged on day one times one, number of wasps emerged on day two times two, et cetera, et cetera. And then we divided that by the number of emerged wasps and that gave us an emergence rate. We did the same for death rate and then calculated a survival rate by subtracting the emergence rate from the death rate. And we undertook this for all parent wasps the next generation of wasps produced on the plants and the next generation of wasps produced in the petri dishes. And once we combined all of those results, we found in this graph here, a higher total fitness in Gaucho and Cruiseropti, the two A's that you can see, than the control. And I'll explain this after I've gone through the, the predator samples. And so moving on to these predators, we undertook this project in tandem with the parasitoids. So at two weeks of plant growth, at the same time as we added those parasitoids, we added two older lacewing juveniles, so around 10 to 12 days old, and two younger juveniles, so around two days old per pot. Removed them after the same period of time, 24 hours, and store them separately. We fed each 100 untainted green peach aphids whilst they were juveniles. And due to the fact that as adults, they're not carnivorous, we then fed them pollen. We measured longevity, pupation, and mortality. However, we did have to cap longevity at 120 days because they just couldn't die. But unfortunately, we did find some high levels of cannibalism due to this combination of different juveniles that we used. And so we repeated the trial that only measured pupation using one younger juvenile per pod. And instead of keeping them on for 24 hours this time, we decided to keep them on for 96 hours and then measured pupation. And these were the results. So this is for the first trial. We found no difference between the treatments for initial mortality, the number of pupations, the number of successful pupations, the time it took to pupate, the duration of the pupation and the longevity of the young and the old lacewing juveniles and also all lacewings combined. However, we did find that the initial mortality of the younger lacewings, you can see this top graph here, so the orange were those that died initially, was higher than that in the older lacewings, which you'll see in the bottom graph here. This is likely due to the fact that they're just more sensitive when they're younger. And lastly, for this, for this first trial, we found that the number of days taken until pupation was obviously greater for the younger lacewings than for the old. Well, this would be expected because they'd all be pupating around the same age. So it took around 11 days for the young lacewings to pupate and around four days for the older, older lacewings to pupate. And I just want to draw your attention to this graph to show you that there was absolutely no difference between the control treatment and any of the seed treatments. But moving on to the next trial, even with that greater exposure time, we still found no difference in the initial mortality, the number of lacewings pupating, and the time to pupate between each of the different seed treatments. So going back to those parasitoids, we didn't know any lethal effects for the parasitoids, only sublethal. But in terms of active ingredients, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. Thymothoxin, which is found within Cruiser 350 FS, has a greater solubility than imidacloprid, which is found in the gaucho treatment. But when thymothoxin is mixed with lambda cyhalothrin, such as in the case of Cruiser Opti, the half-life is reduced. And so it could be suggested the more active ingredient is ingested by aphids, within the Cruiser 350 FS treatment, and in turn the parasitoids 
that may uptake the chemical through feeding on aphid honeydew, for example, than in the cruiser opti and the gaucho treatments. And that could be part of the explanation as to why those aphids found, uh, sorry, the, the predators and parasitoids found on the cruiser treatment fare either the same or worse than on the other sea treatments. But then it makes us question, well, why is there a high fitness in the gaucho and cruiser opti treatments for the parasitoids when compared to the control? Well, one explanation could be hemesis. Uh, the, this is a phenomenon that's caused by sub-harmful levels of an insecticide, for example, causing uh, an increase in efficiency of an organism, either through increased fecundity or oviposition. And there's been lots of studies on this previously, and this could explain why we were finding certain sublethal effects that were positive for these C treatments. But for both the trials for the predators, we found absolutely no difference between the treatments. And previous studies, when they've compared the effects of, of a, a chemical between a predator and a parasitoid, has found that parasitoids generally are more sensitive to these chemicals than predators. And of the predators, lacewings are generally less sensitive than other predators, such as predatory bugs, for example. Part of this may be due to the length of the life of the predator and the parasitoid. Our parasitoids live for around 12 days. Our predators generally live for around 10 times the length of those parasitoids. We kept the exposure time the same, certainly for one of the predatory trials, along with the parasitoids. But if you look at it as a, as a percentage, a proportion of their life length, this is very different. And so if the experiment was to be repeated, we could vary the exposure time to be proportional. So rather than having a set period of time, we could say, well, we'll add those parasitoids and predators to the plants for 10% of their lifetime. And this could give us different results. But this experiment is not quite finished. We're undertaking mass spectrometry on each of the different trophic levels. We have our plants, our aphids, our parasitoids, and our predators. We just want to see if each of those chemicals are present within each of the different trophic levels, and if not, whether metabolites of those chemicals are present. If we find they are, for example, within the aphids, we'd like to see whether the presence of these chemicals are affecting the behavior of the aphids, and whether that could be an explanation for the difference in parasitoid sublethal effects. So green peach aphid are known to kick out at a parasitoid when they're being attacked. If, these if this chemical is present within the aphids or any of the chemicals, is it causing them to kick less? Is it causing them to kick more? Or is there no difference? And so I'm gonna end with a final quote. I mentioned Erasmus Darwin earlier. Now I'm going two generations down to his grandson, Charles Darwin. He said the words in 1860, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the Ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. The Ichneumonidae are a family very closely related to the wasps that I've been looking at. And if Charles Darwin found these, these fantastic guys as a way to explain evolution, it just shows how useful they can be. So I'd like to thank everybody who's involved in this project. It's not just the work of one person and to you for listening. Thank you very much.